Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today, Accelerating Your Data Science Workflow with Google BigQuery and Looker. Before I introduce the presenter, a few items of housekeeping. There's a window, a Q&A window on your console. You can enter those questions at any time. We'll be answering most of the questions um, towards the end of the presentation. And the webinar will be recorded, and we will send you the link um, in uh, two or three days post-webinar. Today's presenters are Hussein Amadi, um, a BigQuery architect at Google Cloud, and then Marcel Babai, Data Science Solutions with Looker. At this time, I'll hand it over to Marcel with, for a, a brief introduction and then um, his presentation. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so today we're just going to talk a, a bit about uh, BigQuery machine learning, which is a, one of the new features that was announced at Google Next um, uh, not that long ago for uh, Google BigQuery and, and involving kind of data scientists in, in, with SQL. And Hussein will talk uh, more about that in depth. And then we're going to follow that up with uh, how Looker and BigQuery work together to make these workflows uh, easy for data scientists today. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Hussein, if you want to get us started off. Thank you, Marcel. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hussein Amadi, and um, I'm going to talk about the new machine learning uh, primitives from BigQuery that uh, combined with Looker can help accelerate the data science workflows. Um, so let me start with uh, taking a look at how BigQuery has uh, evolved data analysis over the past several years. If you go back and look at the uh, data warehouse and business intelligence solutions that were, that were introduced back in 90s and 2000s, um, getting data into the data warehouse and analyzing it was a really difficult task for enterprises. What BigQuery did was to make all of this very simple, making it very simple to get the data into the data warehouse and very simple to analyze that data. This is done through um, removing the need for running services or managing services or setting up complex environments. We understand that today most of the analysis tasks are um, heavily involving uh, machine learning. Uh, so it's a, it's a key requirement for analysis going forward. Uh, so because of that, the next step, next step for BigQuery is really to bring the same uh, to machine learning foundations and making it very easy for uh, enterprises to leverage machine learning and uh, data analysis in their data warehouses. So let's take a look at machine learning and what happens today when we want to perform machine learning on a data warehouse. So a machine learning task often involves getting data out of the data warehouse. In this case, let's say we have some data in uh, Google BigQuery. Um, there are multiple paths towards uh, running uh, machine learning in this data set. Uh, for example, in one scenario when a, an analyst wants to build regression models in Excel or Sheets, uh, they would export a small fraction of data from BigQuery into Sheets and then uh, run linear regression. Um, so it can produce a model, but the accuracy might be low because this is just a small fraction of the data. So they have to go back, fetch the data, or fetch more data, basically, to um, improve the accuracy of the model. So there's going to be iterations over and over again, and every time the data needs to be extracted. So there's a lot of complexity and overhead involved. On the other hand, uh, we might have a data scientist uh, who, who might be interested in building a TensorFlow model or a scikit-learn uh, model. It's the same sort of steps, basically. We need to take the data out of the uh, data warehouse or BigQuery, um, you know, create a TensorFlow model there, and then iterate over it, go back and extract more data or more features to fine-tune the model. So there's still a lot of overhead going back and forth. So we identified two high-level challenges in machine learning today. The first one is that it's 
usually very hard to uh, find data scientists and um, hire them in companies. So it's just not a lot of data scientist uh, resources available to do all of these uh, machine learning tasks. So that kind of limits the amount of uh, machine learning analysis that uh, organizations and companies can do. The second one is that uh, the process of doing machine learning is pretty complex and time consuming because it involves extracting data from the data warehouse and iterating through it multiple times. So to solve that, we are introducing BigQuery ML. It's basically machine learning using SQL within BigQuery. Let me uh, talk a little, a little bit more about that. So we want the, the, the main idea here is that we want to use familiar SQL, what uh, every analyst is used to, uh, for machine learning. And basically through that SQL, be able to train models over all of the data that's already in BigQuery without the need to move the data outside or you know, use a uh, separate tool for that. On top of that, we don't want to worry about hyperparameter tuning or um, any feature transport, uh, transformation. We want all of that to be taken care of uh, by the system. So let's look at the uh, hypothetical example and see how this works. Let's say we have a, a business that has some data in Google Analytics and uh, some revenue data that's kept in-house. Um, they can bring all of that into BigQuery and join that data to um, get more insights. On top of that, with BigQuery machine learning, uh, they can actually build machine learning models easily through SQL and expose the model and the data through uh, reporting and BI platforms such as Looker. Uh, so that enables them to actually go back and retrain the model uh, to optimize it as needed. And uh, the, the model and the data stays in BigQuery, so it's, it's very convenient to do that. Then the final model can be used for predictions, um, you know, for example, to do a, a marketing campaign. So let me uh, talk a little bit more about use cases of this that uh, we currently have over BigQuery Big ML. Uh, so we have a wide range of uh, customers trying it, and they have really uh, interesting results. Uh, one is Hearst News paper that's using BigQuery ML to um, predict customer churn. Uh, Trainer Century Fox is using the Korea ML to um, uh, build media plans for new movies. Uh, Geotag is an application for smart cities. Um, they have a plugin that uses the Korea ML to predict um, you know, accidents or aggressive driving based on weather patterns. News UK is another um, use case. They are using uh, the Korea ML for customer subscription prediction. Smart parking is another smart city application using um, using it for traffic prediction. And finally, Reblaze is a more of a security application, um, and uh, it basically uses the BigQuery ML machine learning um, for uh, automated IP address detection. So let's take a look at the query syntax here. Um, we, for example, if we go back and look at the um, look at the traffic prediction application, we might have a data set that has some um, samples of you know weather data and uh, you know number of trips that are made in that uh, day. Uh, so it's just a regular table in BigQuery. What we can do here, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, we can use a create model statement just the same way as we uh, create a table in BigQuery. And then we specify a model name, we select a few columns, and then uh, we specify a few options here, just a model type, which is linear regression, and uh, the label for our output features. So in this case, we are selecting four features. The number of trips is what we are trying to predict, and days of uh, day of week, precipitation, and temperature are what we are trying to use for uh, as features for this prediction. On the right-hand side, we can see how this model can be used for prediction. So the output of the, the first query is just a model that's stored in BigQuery, and that can be re referenced and used in um, future SQL queries. Uh, so we are on the right-hand side, we are doing a prediction based on a different data set um, based on the same set of features, and we predict a number of uh, trips based on that. 
So what's happening behind the scene, behind these uh, two lines of SQL, is that you are leveraging BigQuery's processing power. Um, there is uh, all the parallelism and all, all the uh, processing power that can be used to do larger scale, um, for example, in this case, linear regression modeling. Uh, the system is also tuning the learning rate, and it's also automatically splitting the data into training and test, so that we get a good evaluation of the model at the end. Uh, we do a standardization of the numeric features, and for string features, we do one-hot encoding as a transformation. So there are these default transformations that uh, make it very easy to, um, to, to do modeling or train models on any uh, kind of structured data. For advanced users, we also support some um, uh, advanced knobs and, and tuning parameters. One is uh, L1, L2 regularization. Another one is the specific strategy for splitting the training and the test sets. Uh, it can be either random, sequential, or, or custom. And uh, they can also set the learning rate. Here are some of the features that BigQuery ML supports. Since it is uh, just a SQL, it supports any standard SQL functionality that BigQuery supports. That includes things like user-defined functions. In terms of modeling, uh, it supports linear regression for forecasting scenarios, and it uh, also includes binary, binary logistic regression for classification. Uh, there are functions uh, built in uh, into SQL that will help uh, doing model evaluation and building things like uh, ROC curves. There is a possibility of inspecting model weights for each individual feature, and there are also functions to help with um, doing feature distribution analysis. So let's uh, take a step back and look at how this all fits within the uh, set of machine learning products uh, in uh, Google Cloud, for example. Uh, we have, uh, on one hand, products such as TensorFlow and CloudML and Gene. Uh, those are really targeted towards expert users, data scientists who have who have deep understanding of machine learning. Uh, but they're very powerful and they, they can be really customized. And the other uh, end of the spectrum, we have uh, products such as AutoML or CloudML API that don't require that much ML knowledge, but uh, they're not easily customizable towards the structured data. BigQuery ML is something in the middle. It builds and deploys custom models using SQL, uh, but it only requires basic understanding uh, of machine learning. Uh, so in short, we are trying to democratize machine learning through SQL, making it av available um, for any enterprise. So we think there are endless possibilities to this. Um, we've talked about some of the use cases, but for example, in uh, marketing sector, we have you know, prediction of customer lifetime value or personalizing ads or emails. In the retail sector, inventory optimizations or revenue forecasting. Uh, in industrial and IoT cases, we already talked about the use cases with traffic uh, forecasts. And uh, finally, media and gaming, we can personalize content, we can plan for media and movies like that 20th Century Fox use case um, or predict player lifetime value. Um, so to see how this all works with Looker, I'm going to hand it off to Marcel to um, to talk about that part. Great, thank you, Usain. That was a great introduction to to BQML and kind of how how it generally lays out uh, the foundation for again kind of democratizing it so SQL SQL developers can can start uh, getting in the machine learning game. Um, before I get into the workflow and how this looks like with Looker. I want to take a step back and kind of talk about the general landscape and what machine learning exercises and projects look like uh, for the typical data scientist these days. Uh, as, as I've tended to see it, uh, both in my work here at Looker and, and prior life, uh, specifically at IBM, doing machine learning over there as well. So what we tend to see is this kind of three phases or three steps to what the uh, data science workflow looks like. So there's the first part, which is this data acquisition, transformation, preparation, whatever you want to call that phase. 
Then the middle section there where you see that Python or R kind of machine learning, that's actually the, the kind of the meat of what we talk about with ML. Um, and then, of course, the last part is how those results actually end up getting used. Um, so going back to the beginning, what we've seen typically is that this uh, kind of transformation or preparation ends up taking about 70 to 80 percent of the time of, of most data scientists. Right. This is requires moving the data because where the data lives and where it is trained tend to be two different locations. Right. And then we have lots of options for where the transformation occurs. So does it occur where it lives somehow in transit or at the training location? Right. Again, we can use SQL to do some of the transformation. We could use Python or R to do transformation. We could use an ETL tool, Excel, whatever it is. Um, we see kind of a ton of permutations of this. Uh, and because of that, it involves very many tools. And this is going to be pretty cumbersome. And it's usually not fun, right? This is not why data scientists became data scientists. The, the, nuance, the nuances here can be vast, right? How many different ways people can uh, have complexities specific to their own use case about why they end up choosing the tools and the methods they use. Um, and, and almost none of that is actually giving us conceptual value add. These are things that just have to be done based on the architecture that they live in and the tools that they have, right? But that's not really, you know, the, some of the transformations are, of course, very important, and feature engineering as a concept is important, but the methods by which we do them are not actually uh, giving us value add. And then, of course, that brings us to the second part, the actual machine learning, which we see oftentimes only giving us, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the time of a data scientist's job is actually doing this, though this is why we hire PhDs, et cetera, to, to do this type of work. Um, typically, again, of course, you're using Python or R or, or some other tools out there. But this is really the fun stuff. This is the stuff that's really giving us the value add. And it's sad to see how little time is actually being spent here uh, because uh, of all the other uh, work that has to go in. And then there's this last part, the using of results. And this one's really hard to get a sense of what the average time or typical amount of time that a user spends uh, in doing this. Um, uh, because oftentimes this just doesn't happen. Uh, the results of the data science work are oftentimes just kind of data science science projects. That's all they are. They're shared with other data scientists. Occasionally when business the business side has questions to ask of what these models produce, they can verbally or by email ask the data scientists, but they don't ultimately get to operationalize these results. That oftentimes will require a custom application, something that's built in Python or R or maybe a whole website or whatever it might be that is used to actually funnel these results either out to the end users in the form of visualizations or, or, or emails and things like that, that they're getting to say, hey, we've got some propensity scores that are high or low, whatever those might be, and that they need to take action or directly automate them into some other system, right? Where we can forecast some prediction of inventory levels being low, so we're gonna order more without even getting a human involved. Again, these usually are, are very uh, costly, so either those are what's gonna take up the most, most of the time here, or they're just gonna say, hey, this isn't worth our time, we're not even going to bother. So that's kind of what it typically looks like. So let's see what this can look like now with uh, Looker involved um, and, and BQML. So the first and foremost, and what kind of is the one of the biggest strengths that BigQuery brings to the table here is that BQ is the home of the data. It's a transformation layer as well as the ML layer now. So we don't have to worry about making decisions about where we're doing the transformations in the machine learning and at what point do we move the data before we're doing the transformations, et cetera. Those decisions are all taken care of because, uh, again, one of the things that we don't need to take into account is the computational power. Obviously, BigQuery has an insane amount of computational power, so don't need to worry about that being another variable in this equation of where everything is happening. Then in comes Looker where this is going to now be the logical layer. So Looker brings the logical prowess of SQL, right, that we can use all of the, the functionality there with the kind of code utilities that one would expect from Python or R. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with, with Looker, Looker at its core has LookML, a logical language. It's kind of a modeling layer where we can describe what type of SQL to write to our database, but in such a way that brings things like encapsulation, inheritance, reusability, version control, 
and easy to understand metrics and definitions without having to write massive SQL statements. So all of that is done with Looker, and because Looker is going to be the method by which we interact with BigQuery, we never need to leave the tool. So again, that whole sprawl of different tools that data scientists are using, that can be reduced and simplified heavily here. And that brings us to the right-hand side of how do we actually present this. Well, Looker as a BI tool ultimately has things like visualizations um, that, again, Looker is running queries on BigQuery, surfacing those results and displaying those in the browser. But we also have capabilities like APIs and webhooks and embedded analytics and alerting, all of these different tools that allow us to now do those more complicated versions of data delivery without having to make custom applications for and getting you know, web developers or other software engineers involved. You can use simple things like webhooks to just get this data out to where it needs to go. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is actually a live demo here. So I'm just gonna share my screen. This will just take a moment, please. And see when that is going to be good to go in just a moment. There we go. So hopefully you guys can see my screen okay here. And what we're looking at now is some LookML itself. So this is kind of how the language works. For those, again, who are unfamiliar, uh, essentially what we're doing is embedding little snippets of SQL, regardless of how complex they are, inside of the LookML language. So we get to kind of encapsulate these little pieces. And what I wanted to show here is one example that is relatively complex here, though the complexity can span much deeper, where we're looking at, uh, we're using a correlated subselect with an injected parameter by the end user, potentially, um, to calculate something, in this case, some number of days in the future that uh, a purchase is being made. By the way, the underlying data here is GA360 data. And what we're trying to do is predict whether somebody will make a purchase in the future or not make a purchase in the future based on data within the uh, um, uh, within a session. So let's take a look here. So this uh, will purchase in future is, is what we're going to be using from here on out. And that's the thing that we're going to be trying to predict. That's going to be our label. Um, so coming to another set of code here, this is, again, LookML's way of defining queries, what we call derive tables. So in this case, what we're doing is we're going to be deriving um, essentially a training input for our BQML model. So we have uh, several columns here that are going to be our inputs, and this will purchase in future is going to be our label. Um, one thing to note here is that this is Looker's way of referencing those columns, but the truth of the matter is these could be arbitrarily complex, just like the will purchase in future would be. So there could be subselects, all of the com complex joins required for making this is abstracted away. The same way that we would in Python functions or R functions, we don't want to have one massive set of code. This is kind of a limitation that SQL uh, as a whole can oftentimes have in terms of how, how we're interacting with the database. So um, kind of just moving through, and, and I, I apologize for anybody that can't see the screen. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get some screenshots out of this for, for syntax for those that weren't able to. Um, uh, but for those who can, I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here to how we actually are defining the uh, machine learning model here. So in this example, we're again, we're predicting that we'll purchase in the future using logistic regression. And here's just that syntax that Hussein went over earlier, right? This is going to be verbatim exactly how BigQuery takes care of it um, just by putting in the parameters that we want, the labels, the model type, et cetera. But the nice thing here is that we can simply reference the tables that we've already created earlier. So in this case, that training input that I made before. Now, I know there's a lot of details here about the training and testing set. I don't want to get into the details of how that is working here, but in Looker, we can define two different sets as well. Um, and for the purposes of uh, the training, I'm using one set. And then for testing later, I'm going to use another data set here. Okay, so once I've defined this, again, because it's just a table in BigQuery, I can now either query that or use some of the evaluation functions that we evaluate. Again, it's just taking in that model as well as the testing data set that I want. 
and spitting out various uh, columns, which I can now reference as dimensions and measures. And there's a few functions like this, evaluate ROC curve, training info. Instead of showing all of those uh, here, I'm actually just going to go to a dashboard that we built inside of Looker that kind of shows what the breadth of fields are that have been exposed inside uh, of, uh, of Looker or rather through BigQuery's uh, um, tables that it's generated. So here we have some basic information, uh, accuracy, recall, et cetera, ROC curve. So these are nice for checking out what that performance looked like at a glance in a real simple way. We also have training metrics, how many iterations it took, the time it took, the loss curve. So all of that is here, and it's kind of, with, with Looker, this kind of just comes out of the box. This is just a dashboard we can have up in, in minutes. Of course, if there are custom metrics that you want to use on top of this, then you can easily, of course, implement those as well, just the same way using Looker and LookML. Um, so in principle, if I wanted to make any changes to my model, all I would need to do is come over here, uh, clear cache and refresh, and it would give me all of these metrics again. So it's a really simple way for the data scientist to iterate on that model, going back to generating those features by simply putting in different columns into the training set, coming back to this dashboard, refreshing it, and having it work. That said, once we're in production, we can set the cadence for retraining the model via what Looker calls data groups, basically checking for any changes in the underlying data to then uh, reset and rebuild our model for us. But we can also make these dashboards themselves interactive on top of how the model works, right? So there's a trade-off that we can get based on the precision and the recall and our accuracy based on what thresholds we're using to determine whether some we're, we're sensi how sensitive the model is effectively. So for example, maybe recall is something that I care more about. I can adjust the threshold, rerun this. This is not actually changing the model, it's just using the model in a different way, so to speak. And we see that we've boosted the recall, in this case, at some cost for accuracy and potentially precision as well. So again, this is how we can go back and forth for that data scientist to determine how they want to use this model, how to best tweak the model for performance, et cetera. But now let's move again to that last segment of how do we actually expose this out to end users and make it available to them in a way that they can use. So we've created another dashboard here where you can imagine kind of I'm maybe a marketing uh, campaign creator. I don't know necessarily very much about machine learning or how that works, but I can make some assumptions and start playing around with the results. So now we're using that predict function that Hussein mentioned earlier on new unlabeled data where we can still make some estimates, right? So I can, again, have that threshold, maybe some other uh, assumptions that I have here, or maybe these themselves could be the outputs of machine learning models. Um, again, this is just uh, all for the sake of example, where now I'm essentially trying to do an ROI calculation. And I have that same threshold here of that 8%, but maybe I'll switch that to 9%, um, be a little bit tighter down on, on how I'm uh, uh, evaluating these, getting a smaller list of people and paying less and getting a higher ROI. So this allows that end business user to actually be able to take the model without understanding the inner workings or how it worked and have a dashboard like this that they can actually interact with and get value out of. And this is something that didn't require any custom coding, no Python scripts or, or web applications being built. This is just Looker kind of out of the box uh, working the way that it does. Okay, so hopefully that gives you guys kind of an impression what this looks like end to end from the data scientist having that data in uh, BQ, BigQuery and then using BQML with Looker to develop these models and ultimately get it in the hands of the end business users, really cutting down the time that is needed. You know, typically we see these projects being months and months long and something that can be iterated upon within, you know, a matter of days or weeks. Perfect. So kind of moving forward a little bit here, just want to, uh, let's see if we can advance to the next slide, just putting a little plug in here for JOIN. JOIN is Looker's annual conference. It will be happening in uh, San Francisco, October 9th, October 11th. Uh, you can go to the website, join2018.com, find out more information. Lots of talks, customers are giving, partners are giving about uh, kind of how they're using Looker uh, along with other technologies. Obviously, Google is going to be there. We'll be giving uh, a similar talk to this one there as well. Uh, you can meet us, ask your questions in person as well if there's anything we don't get to today or something that you think about at, at a later time. 
And for just more resources, both on BigQuery and on Looker, um, here's just some links that we have uh, for, for all of you just um, to take a look at if you want to learn more about either of these two. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for listening. I think at this point, we're just going to start getting to the Q&A. Um, Hussein, if you want, if you've had a chance to look through and have some questions that you want to answer for everyone, um, I'll also start looking through what you guys have submitted. But uh, everybody, f feel free to write in your questions now if there's anything we didn't get to or something you want clarified. So um, I can start answering some of the questions uh, in the list. Uh, so there was a question about doing retraining. Uh, so in, in the BQML, BigQuery ML syntax, uh, one of the options that can be specified on the create model is uh, called warm start, which means that if it's set to true, the uh, current model will be reused and basically uh, retrained uh, with the new data. Um, I, I think also can expand whether there are more features uh, related to Looker uh, with respect to that. Oh yeah, I just want to say so that that can also be handled by that uh, data group uh, triggers that I was talking about earlier, where you can simply set a, a cadence for how often Looker is going to retrain the model within Looker itself. Okay, thank you. Um, Another question was whether uh, BigQuery ML can be used with other cloud databases. So BigQuery supports some uh, accessing uh, some other databases, for example, cloud, uh, Google Cloud Bigtable. And anything that uh, BigQuery supports basically in terms of uh, getting the data or querying the data directly will be supported in BigQuery ML. Obviously, there are um, load functionalities that would uh, enable you to move data from other databases to BigQuery and then uh, running BigQuery ML. So that would be another way of uh, handling those queries. Um, Another question was on the strategy that's used for standardization of numeric features. Um, so what we are using is basically the standard deviation of the numeric values, and we are basically dividing the difference between the uh, values uh, from the mean by the standard deviation, which is the uh, uh, traditional definition of the standard, uh, standardization. standardization. Um, so Martha, maybe there are a few more questions yeah. that you might want to handle. Definitely, yeah. So there's a few questions in here about getting access to this code or looker blocks, et cetera. There, the, the code that I was just showing is literally a block for GA360 BQML uh, uh, data that will be made available uh, soon. It might be at join if I'm not mistaken, um, but that's definitely coming soon and, and you guys will have all, access to play around with all of this. Um, let's see. So uh, one question I'm seeing here is uh, linear and logistic regression. Um, Hussein, I don't know if you know anything about the future of this. So right now, those are the two that are available, but can you touch upon what other uh, algorithms will be available in the future? Uh, yes, those are uh, the only two that's available right now, but we are working on a few uh, more models and we'll, we're going to announce it very soon. So stay tuned. Perfect. Um, there's a question here about the uh, output produced by Looker and how that's deployed to production. So again, the output that's produced by Looker is, is what BigQuery outputs, right? So ultimately, these are all just tables within uh, BQML that Looker has created. Uh, that also have the functions associated with them, the evaluate, the predict, et cetera. So once those tables exist in BigQuery, they are queryable, again, via Looker or potentially other tools, and those results can be pushed um, to anywhere. Obviously, as I was showing with, with Looker itself, those uh, results can be pushed to email, to uh, API calls, uh, webhooks, et cetera. So a lot of different options for that. Um, Kind of uh, again that that list that I was creating of of uh, email addresses you could imagine just sending that directly to from Looker's UI to something like uh, Mailchimp or, or Marketo or something like that. Uh, there's a question about getting access to Looker itself to play around with it. This is a perfect uh, time to you can go to our website um, and and find out more about it and and get ac uh, ask for a demo. 
We do do trials of Looker, so that's something that uh, is available. Um, again, getting in touch with, with one of us to get a, your hands on it is, is uh, something we, we always like to get people to play around with it a little bit and, and see what it's all about. So there's a question about uh, how to determine whether um, a feature is categorical versus numerical. Uh, so what BigQuery ML does is it uses the schema of the table. Uh, basically, if the field or a column is a string field, it's uh, assumed to be categorical. Or if it's an uh, integer or a float, it's uh, numerical. There's a question about the uh, the test input, and I'm sorry, I, I kind of glazed over that really quickly. I, I didn't want to get too focused on the methodology here, more on the workflow. Um, the the sequential split that I did there was literally just on time, right? I didn't want to uh, bias my uh, uh, testing or training data set, so to speak, with having data from the future, so uh, kind of, if that makes sense. Um, again, this is really getting in the weeds here. So all I did was I had my training data set from one time period and had all, everything in my testing data set uh, shifted over another time period um, because that's what it's going to look like in the real world, right? I can't train on data from the future uh, to predict something that's happening now. Um, so that's how I split it up. That way, there's no uh, essentially overfitting that I could be doing based on uh, the future, uh, so to speak. But again, from a, a, an implementation perspective, that's literally just putting filters on the dates. Really straightforward to do in, in LookML. And those training and testing inputs were otherwise identical. So there is a question about the underlying assumptions about uh, the data that BigQuery ML makes. Um, so we are using standard linear and logistic regression methods right now, which typically don't have any assumption in data distribution. Obviously, if there are uh, linear relationships in the uh, features, that would uh, that would show up in the linear model. Uh, but more complex models will be able to take advantage of the data distribution. I got a couple questions in here talking about BigQuery with Looker and another one, <laughs> interestingly enough, about um, bringing on-premise data files, so like Excel or something like that. So ultimately, Looker is SQL-based, right? And uh, which is one of the main reasons BigQuery is so good with it is because of the power, right? When we're talking about BigQuery versus a whole slew of other databases, it's just generally speaking, and in my experience, I've worked with, dozens, if not at this point, hundreds of customers with, with Looker uh, during my time here, BigQuery is by far one of the fastest ones, not to mention it has features like PQML that uh, a lot of other databases don't have anything like that. Um, as well as going back to the Excel file thing, there's actually a method where you can take uh, any spreadsheet that you have in Google Sheets and link it to BigQuery so that you can query that sheet as if it were a table inside of BigQuery, which is just an awesome little feature uh, BigQuery has. Obviously, Looker then can then take advantage of that as well. A couple of questions just kind of generally about Looker and its differences with uh, with other BI tools. I think that, you know, that's that's a that's a long, long question. And I think that's uh, for a different kind of a different type of webinar. But the one thing that I hope is, is clear already from, from this point is that Looker is, is uh, fundamentally SQL-based, so it really inherits all the capabilities of the SQL database that you're working with. So again, from this particular example, the fact that Looker kind of has machine learning built in if you're using uh, BigQuery, right? You, you don't have to have any other add-on or anything like that. You know, BigQuery has other uh, functionality like nested table structures that Looker immediately takes advantage of. So there's a, a huge synergy between Looker and all the advances in database technologies that are out there. Um, and that's, that's probably one of the big differentiators. Again, lots of other things that, uh, to talk about in terms of the pros and cons of various BI tools, but especially as related to this conversation, I think that's one of the key ones. So again, there is uh, another question about, uh, or maybe a couple of questions about uh, type of model supported, specifically if neural networks are supported. Currently, it's only linear and logistic regressions, and uh, neural networks are not supported, but we are we're working on expanding the model type, so uh, please look for announcements. There's a question here about how much data is required to make predictions. So, 
Um, you know, this is a, a pretty open-ended question. Uh, Hussein, I don't know if there's anything you specifically want to say. I would, I, I generally just say the more data, the better, the, <laughs> generally speaking. Do you know about kind of optimal amounts for uh, BQML in terms of its performance or in any specific benchmarking that's been done along those lines? So in terms of performance of running the modeling and doing the prediction, I mean, if you're using, uh, you know, scalable BigQuery execution engine, which should handle, you know, any data set that, you know, BigQuery typically handles, uh, which is, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data. Um, so the more data there is, obviously, the better and uh, will scale and perform at, at that scale. Uh, particularly, you know, for a specific um, modeling task, how many, you know, samples are needed. It obviously depends on the feature and the, and the nature of uh, the, the correlations and distribution of data that a linear model uh, could be um, could be created if fewer samples or not. But in general, BigQuery um, can handle any data size, and the more data it will be better. Awesome. There's a question here on. Uh, the ease of learning Looker time frame to run queries. If, if you know SQL already, Looker is something that you can pick up, uh, you know, the basics of at least within an afternoon. Now, obviously, there's a lot to be done in terms of uh, a lot of features, but uh, building LookML models to be able that will ultimately write SQL on your behalf, uh, it's, it's using all the concepts of SQL, so it's pretty straightforward to learn. And then there's lots of uh, good documentation online already for it. Uh, a question about data analytics, uh, kind of academic partner programs and things like that. So as of right now, Looker does not have anything like that, but I know it's something that we've talked a lot about. So uh, potentially coming up uh, relatively soon. Uh, I, I, it's nothing official, but um, you know, getting in with universities where there are uh, programs around SQL and data, uh, definitely something that we would want to do. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, resources and time at this point. There's a question about the output of the linear regression example that I showed. Uh, so running the create model command will um, just create the model in BigQuery and doesn't produce anything. Um, the model can be inspected for weights um, through, you know, BigQuery UIs. Uh, and uh, also there are functions like ML that evaluate that would uh, do some analysis uh, on the data, such as uh, the loss function. So there's a question about when defining uh, the model in Looker, how do you specify that some field is a label or a feature? So everything is a feature unless you specify in the BigQuery create model statement that it is the label. Um, otherwise, everything's going to be a feature in your query. So that's why I did the select star from input table. And that brings me everything uh, with just uh, the label being defined um, at, the, at, at the level of the create model statement. So there's a question about a tutorial using uh, logistic regression. So in, in BigQuery, so all of this uh, BigQuery syntax and all of that is documented online. So you should be able to find that. Um, I, I believe the uh, um, the link might be up there. Or, yeah, if you look for BigQuery, just search search online. It should be really easy to find if you you know Google it. So I see a lot of questions, uh, again, kind of about Looker in general as a BI tool, um, mostly uh, kind of questions for a different type of conversation. Uh, again, looking at, at our materials online, I think, is a, a good start there. Um, and, and just, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that Join is for. If you have the uh, opportunity to go to an event like that, uh, we can talk your ear off about that. <laughs> Um, lot, lots of differences, not exactly a uh, something that we can summarize in a few minutes here on the webinar. Great. Thank you, Marcel and Hussein. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. I'm sorry for any technical issues you may have experienced. Um, again, the webinar is has been recorded, and I will send you out the link on Friday. Again, thank you very much for attending.